Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Genuine Chits Chat. This week, I chat with my buddy Josh for another instalment of Science But Simple. Now, for anyone just tuning in for the first time, welcome, <laughs> hello. Um, basically, with Genuine Chit Chat, I try and interview or chat with a different person, essentially, every episode. I, I do have some recurring guests, but generally speaking, I try and have a different topic each episode and keep every episode something different. Um, but my buddy Josh, he's got a degree in marine biology, uh, he's incredibly intelligent, he knows loads about science, and so I thought it'd be good every you know, a couple of months or so, just to sit down with him, ask him a few questions about science, really. Um, we talk about, we've done a few episodes of this before, so you can check through the back catalogue where we talk about light bulbs and energy and tides and the sun and debunking, you know, uh, some misconceptions about science and things like that. And this episode, we're talking about climate change. So we talk about the weather, uh, global warming, uh, deforestation, um, skin pigmentation, climate science, ecology, the seasons, the environment, methane, carbon dioxide, the ozone layer, things things like that. It's it's a real good chat just about kind of the bigger picture of Earth instead of sort of really small specific things. So it's we, we do get into details about things and it once again as always it's an incredibly interesting conversation. And we also talk about how the temperature of the earth and different environments change the gender of certain reptiles uh, and amphibians basically turtles is, is one of the the main ones we speak about is the gender of turtles are affected by temperature which is incredibly interesting for me um, and obviously that goes into the whole climate change global warming sort of argument i'd say even though we get into it and say it shouldn't really be just an argument really um, but without getting too much into that right now um Thanks as always, guys, for listening. I really appreciate it. And after a promo by the Station Wagon Podcast, I'll get right into it. So, um, yeah, enjoy the show, and I'll be back at the end. You start. If someone said to you, Mark, what is the Station Wagon Podcast, that show you do with your sister, what, what would you say? Our show's all about mindfulness. That's too vague, specifically. Outcomes. Yeah, okay, so you're always right, and I'm always wrong. Okay, perfect. But more specifically... God taking a look at those things that we take for granted, giving them up for a while, and telling you how it goes so you don't have to do it. Google us, the Station Wagon Podcast, or at wagonpod.com. Welcome to Genuine Chit Chat, where we have honest conversations with interesting people. And I'm your host, Mike Burton. Um, I had salmon with paprika and lemon seasoning because that shit is the tits. Zest. No, not zest. Not zest. It's, it's no, lit- no. It's actually What's like- what is lemon zest? What's the difference between lemon zest? And lemon zest is essentially like the grated skin. I didn't know that. And now that you've told me that, I'm going to keep that in the episode because legit, <laughs> I thought lemon zest was just some sort of fancy ass word for it. <laughs> no, it's literally like... So there's actually so much in terms of lemon flavour in the skin. Oh, yeah. That's why it's with, used, like, they do lemon orange, drizzle they? cakes. And, it, orange peel and things like mm-hmm. that. It's used quite a lot in uh, alcohol and stuff because they mm-hmm. can sort of ferment the... Um... Or when it, when Nikki made the um, the lemon cake she made before, yeah. there was lemon zest in the actual cake mix. She used it in the cake oh, mix. Oh, so you so do that's the shavings what, yeah. of... Okay, that, ex- that does explain a lot. See, this is why I have you on here. This is this this is the important stuff. Before Science But Simple even gets going, mm-hmm. I'm learning about lemon zest. The more you know. <laughs> the more you know. Anyway, I'm going to pause it now for a second to check to make sure all this isn't rubbish. And if it, the audio quality is okay, we can start recording. If not, we just do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just read inorganically, we'll do it again. How do we start talking about lemon zest? Dare you. It's, it's always a good time to talk about lemon zest, my friend. But, um... Welcome to another episode of Science But Simple. And I'm never going to ever do it like that again that was very loud i feel sorry for all the viewers as you know you'll probably turn that a little bit down in the, in the audio <laughs> that's, like, see more. that's what i do in my audio if there, there's the the podcast i did with molly and we at some point we're just laughing insanely loudly and Flip. i had to like normalize the audio numerous times and yeah. in certain sections i looked at it and you can see like the sound waves mm-hmm. and it's all like quite low key and then spike and you're like what and you listen to it and Clipping it's like intensifies <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Exactly, but I've already started recording, that's why I yelled really loud. Um, and I've just eaten loads of food and watched 13 Reasons Why, so I'm kind of all over the place, because that show hurts me emotionally. <laughs> it makes you so emotionally fueled, it's really weird. But science, but simple. Um, I think this week... Uh, f- I, well, we'll, we'll, is this four or five? 
Um, this is four. Four. Because we did okay. uh, the first one, which was light bulb. Second one was gravity, the moon, and tides. Third was debunking, and then this mm-hmm. is uh, climate change. I almost just said science for simple again, which it is. Uh, you gonna... just did say it again. I did. Yeah. Ha ha. Ha ha. Breaking. Played the yourself. Sorry. Played yourself. Played myself. Yeah. Holler. Swish. You know. No. Play yourself. You got to play yourself because then people can't play you, dog. It should be on a t-shirt or something. It shouldn't be. But um. Yeah, I'm not going to go into all the details about uh, what all science but simple stuff is because I do that all in all the intros when I'm slightly more sane and I've had to sit down and calm myself down for a short period of time. So let's get into it. Let's fucking do it. Um, I was going to say the first thing we were talking about uh, because every time we have a discussion to do with science but simple, I learn more stuff before doing the episode than you know. I learn more more stuff. And you're, oh, did you know this? Like, no. Did you know this? No. Do you know this? No. It's like okay. Clearly, I know nothing. Um, so let's do the basics. Um, climate and weather. I, I knew there was a difference, mainly because you asked a leading question, asking if I knew what the difference was. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guessed, and I was wrong. So would you like to enlighten our fair listeners of the difference between climate and weather? So I feel like this is one of the bigger... Or not big, but, but like, uh, maybe not bigger, but most important misconceptions that people make Mm. um and they talk about weather as if it was like and things like climate change and that thing they talk about the weather yeah um and weather and climate are two distinct different things uh that obviously they're related to each other in certain ways but weather is much more of a an immediate in at that point in time at that instant it's raining it's hail there's snow uh there's it, the wind and all that sort of thing whereas yeah. climate is going to be things like your average temperatures your highs and lows over a year your rainfall for the year all that sort of thing like yeah. the long term things like even longer than just a year though like you can have a climate a stable climate that just sticks for centuries and and that's what climate change slash global mm-hmm. warming is all about and we can get into that a little bit uh, later on I guess um, so obviously the thing is for everyone to understand for clarity obviously like the Sahara Desert, you know, everyone knows that's a really hot place. You know, the mm-hmm. climate there is hot, but that doesn't mean that the weather in Britain, and there isn't times where the temperature's higher, or there isn't times where it's hotter here, just because mm-hmm. the weather at the time here happens to be obviously hotter and that sort of stuff, and the weather there happens to be colder. It, it's even though the Sahara Desert is obviously, you know, hotter in general, and that's obviously what the climate is. So I mean, you, you might even find that often in places in deserts such as the Sahara. Um, because there's so little water, you don't get cloud cover at night. Hmm. So all of that heat that's absorbed into the earth, on into the ground over that period of time, just goes overnight. And you often go into sub-zero temperatures overnight hmm. uh, in the deserts, I believe. Yeah. So it's it's like the, the, the climate, the average temperature between the Sahara and here in the UK might not actually be too different because both have fairly stable climates, mm. but they're obviously very much two distinct uh, climate systems with the desert and the UK. I mean, yeah. just talk about how much rain we have. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a typical think... thing about English people talking about the weather. It's basically, yeah, overcast, rain and tea. That seems to be, and football. And bad teeth, apparently. Oh, God, please according, ignore the football. According to the rest of the world. Yeah, we're talking about football. It's not. Yeah. It's one thing on my podcast I don't talk about. And sport. <laughs> but there's plenty of other places. There so. are hundreds of other podcasts you can listen to. Like the True Geordie podcast. That's actually a good one. Anyway. Um, the I was going to say something and I lost it. Oh, yeah. The desert. I, I remember hearing that... Is it Antarctica? Is actually classed as a desert? Because desert uh, yeah. is... Desert basically doesn't actually... Isn't to do with the... Or the climate of the heat or anything it's to do with the survivability is that right yeah so i believe you probably it's probably even more useful to look this up quickly yeah but the definition of a desert is more to do with the uh, ability to actually sustain a lot of life and uh, access to liquid water and all that sort of thing it's all life on this planet at least depends on liquid water due to its properties as a um a solvent yeah. Or can dissolve things. Yeah. Well, I've, I've just Googled it. And now, a region so arid because of little rainfall that it supports only sparse and widely spaced vegetation or no vegetation at all. And the example is the Sahara 
is a vast sandy desert. And then mm-hmm. it's got two other little sort of sub things, which is um, an area in which few forms of life can exist because of lack of water, permanent frost, or absence of soil. Mm-hmm. And then also an area of the ocean in which it is believed no marine life exists. So things like Antarctica and the Sahara, although obviously very different, both classes, deserts. Yeah, there you go. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, cool. Well, so let's just get into it. Obviously, this is science but simple, and we don't want to assume that anyone knows anything within reason. Um, so one thing, which is a lot of people would have most likely learned this in school, but let's just uh, reiterate about um, the seasons and just why. Well, the, the, Obviously, you're much more astute about this than I am. Uh, with the seasons, you know, the earth tilting on its axis and that sort of thing. So like... Mm-hmm. summer winter why obviously for us in the uk compared to australia we have essentially opposite seasons uh in the year so like do you want to go into that sort of uh yeah okay so um one thing to clarify here is that um there a, another misconception some people have is that the seasons are because of how far away the earth is from the sun mm-hmm. uh that's not the case there are uh, the earth's orbit is elliptical it's not a circle it's not a perfect circle we will be closer and slightly further away at different times yeah but that might be just like a few tens of kilometers when we're hundreds of thousands or millions of kilometers away from the sun i don't know the exact distance um but in terms of yeah it's the scale of we do get a bit closer and a bit further away but in the grand scheme of how far away we are, it's insignificant. Mm -hmm. So the temperature difference that would be because of that would be minimal. Yeah. Uh, So the way that seasons work is because the Earth is tilted on its axis, Mm -hmm. I believe at something like 23.5 degrees. (laughs) And it's somewhere around that that sort of line. Okay. Um, But the thing is, during the the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere have alternating seasons uh so in our summer the axis is tilted towards the sun i just want to say you were dead right it is 23.5 yeah i I mean some of the space stuff we do in the physics course stuff is it's like stuff like that and this but this tilt changes during the cycle of um the averages in the average of forty thousand years the tilt of the axis can um it'll it'll wobble slightly 22.1 and 24.5 but you're remembering 23.5 that's very good Mm -hmm. sorry i did interrupt you just to clarify that point but sorry uh, so, yeah, the, the axis of the earth although it wobbles slightly mm. remains in a, a, a fixed orientation so yeah. uh where, whether wherever you are around the earth the axis in terms of the angle and position and everything the the uh the axis that stays the same yeah. so when you're on one side of the earth it's tilted away from it mm-hmm. if you say the top is till being the top further away is tilted away yeah and when you get to the other side it's then tilted towards the sun right so what you're saying is so does the earth not actually it doesn't the earth doesn't go from 23.5 degrees one way and then tilts all the way back to 20.3 20, 20, yeah the, 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 the axis way. doesn't the, a, the position it's... of the axis at, on a grand scale yeah does not change and certainly doesn't essentially flip to be the opposite direction as you're moving i used to think that so the way i would visualize it really easily for people is literally just a forward slash on a keyboard like as in the literal the slash line that you have that and it goes round and it it stays like that yeah it stays it doesn't but obviously if this tilt is tilting off to the left and it's on the left of the sun it's tilting away Mm -hmm. obviously if it's tilting to the left and it's to the right of the sun it's tilting towards which is obviously why that's why it makes yeah there you go yeah and essentially what happens then is uh, the sun is essentially a, a point that is emitting radiation in all directions equally, mm-hmm. roughly. Give or take like sunspots and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and then a certain amount of that light or radiation overall, because it's not just light, um, hits the Earth or falls on the Earth mm-hmm. or any planet. Um, and the way that the Earth's tilted means that the the bit that's exactly um, perpendicular, so the the bit that's essentially in like perfect line with the sun, mm-hmm. it's most intense. Yeah. Um, and as you go north or south, um, the curvature of the planet being almost spherical mm-hmm. um, means that the further north you get, the more that light gets spread out. Right. Which means you have let lower intensity, mm-hmm. uh, or I, I think you think uh, one of the ways they measure it is like watts per square meter. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, which that basically means that the further north or south you go, mm. the lower the concentration of energy coming in is. Yeah. Uh, and during a summer, so whether it's the summer for, for example, the northern hemisphere, mm-hmm. um, our side, our the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, mm. um, and then for our winters, it's tilted away, mm-hmm. and that just means that as we're rotating on the axis, when we're in the during our daytime at least, we're tilted more towards that perpendicular like 90 degree point mm-hmm. um and then in the winter we're tilted farther away yeah so we have and that makes a much much bigger difference than that little change in the distance we are from the sun at any point during our orbit yeah yeah so it's a, it's a way of uh a kind of way i was thinking about it. it's obviously with concentration it's basically there is x let's just use the word use 100 for example because it's much mm-hmm. easier to use there's a hundred energy coming from the sun obviously it, that energy, that amount is, when you're saying when the uh, with the Earth's tilt, obviously when it's further up or further down, that same hundred is still there. It's just o- spread out. So it's yeah. obviously if that if that hundred is only over ten miles, then that's really really intense. But that hundred, if it's over a hundred miles, it's the same ten times. Amount. It's basically a tenth. Exactly. If you go and by that. that's so a really easy way to understand it. Maybe a bit less if you go by area and like. The mass, exact mass of it is not the re- point. But, we could yeah. probably spend about four hours talking about the like tiny outliers in the sun, but um, this is a family show, even though the, I swear quite a lot. <laughs> good, the good thing about this is that if you have, say, a, a, a kitchen roll tube mm-hmm. and a torch yeah. and a football or something, yeah. uh, you can literally like model this effect and see it okay. in action. All you need to do is have the torch, pop the kitchen roll over the front so it creates a more focused beam, mm-hmm. and then if you just hold the ball and point the torch light at the middle and you'll see it's all like in that point. Yeah. And then if you move it up, don't keep pointing it directly at. Mm-hmm. Um so you need to if you're you need to keep um the angle that the torch is to your ball exactly the same. So don't tilt it so that it goes with the curve. Just keep it exactly, uh, horizontal yeah. and move it up and you'll see that light eventually just just spread across the surface more so mm. you're covering more area yeah and you, you so you can actually model it with just a torch ball and a, a tube of some kind to physically see that effect that's awesome yeah so people could do that at home i mean mm-hmm. to be honest you can even use your smartphone torch so you could literally just all you need is your phone a kitchen roll and uh we'll get you might tube. not cover quite enough area it is uh just to do with the the size of the source probably might not be too great for it yeah, I mean, a normal torch is normally the best way to go, but, yeah. you know, we're in the millennial generation, so what the fuck's a torch and a CD and cassettes? People don't know anymore. Phone, phone torches are good because they do cover quite a large area, Yeah, but in terms of actually di- trying to direct it at oh, something, God, it's yeah. probably not that and, great. If anyone so. knows, you ever go out in the woods with a phone torch and it is mm. not great, you have a normal torch and it works so much better because, obviously, as you say, it's all about the... Uh, it's the focusing of the light and obviously when you buy torches they have certain wattages and, and brightnesses and whatnot so it's like mm-hmm. whereas a phone torch is just like an add-on but um, okay yeah so um, with the seasons obviously what w- obviously comes with when you get more sunlight and less sunlight that obviously affects climate and, and mm-hmm. uh, that affects well not, it does affect climate but it affects the weather obviously you know with I was going to say this is like a really tiny thing but obviously the clouds, the way they're made, it's it's the, the heat from the sun makes the water evaporate into mm-hmm. water vapor, goes into the, uh, it's, it's not it's the sky, but it's it's like the first layer of the it's not stratosphere. I don't know. I'm terrible with these. Uh, there's there's multiple different layers to the atmosphere. I wouldn't I be able to reel them off by that's name. Fine. We won't go into but that. But essentially, you have water on the surface of the earth. Mm. It evaporates. Mm. It's less it's it's hot and relatively hot mm. and less dense yep. so it then rises mm-hmm. at a point in the atmosphere it then cools uh and the air can no longer hold the vapor as a gas mm-hmm. so it condenses so clouds are essentially big uh bodies of tiny 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 little water droplets yeah and when they start to join together and become big enough that they can't like sustain themselves in the air. Yeah. That's when they, the clouds break and the rain falls. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I've when I went skydiving, actually went for a cloud. That's pretty cool. Um, but I was going to say also with um, I don't know if you know the answer to this. I'm hoping you will. Uh, why is it that when like I always thought when I was younger, if you go up 
towards the sun, you'd mm-hmm. obviously, in theory, without knowing anything about science, you'd get warmer. I always just think, you know, when you get the top of mountains have got snow on it, and I always the idea of Icarus and mm-hmm. waiting too close, too close to the sun and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, that probably didn't help um, me in. But so why is it you go high altitude and there's is it because there's less oxygen in the air which can hold the heat or something? Or? Uh, no, so, well, I mean there is less oxygen in the air. Yeah, but it's not that there's less oxygen as a proportion in the air. Right, it's just that the air is less dense. Okay. And because that means it's it's basically particle theory. Right. Um temperature of something is uh essentially kinetic energy at a particle level. Right. Okay. Uh and things you feel temperature basically by like numbers of collisions and all that sort of thing. That's um really when you when you get very high, the atmosphere is less dense, which is, you know, pressure and all that yeah. sort of thing. Um so that basically means there's less particles. Yeah. If there's less particles, there's less collisions, so it's colder. That, that makes a lot. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly reasonable. Yeah, that makes sense. So, okay, that's cool. Um, right, so we've gone over, um, and obviously with the seasons thing, uh, with the hemispheres. So with like Australia and England, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, good they're good examples because they're on op- essentially opposite hemispheres. So obviously, when we're in summer, due to them being on the other side of the Earth and at the different tilt. When it's our summer, it's their winter, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So that's why that sort of happens. Um, another quick uh, caveat: I didn't want to get. Uh, I was tempted to not put this, say this, but I'm going to say anyway. Um, it's a bit political, but it really shouldn't be. There's a thing you can look up online, which is literally the melanin in someone's skin is directly linked to when it comes to like ancestry and things. It's directly linked to how close you are to the equator. You know, we've yes. seen that, that it's the gradient of uh, from where the equator is, the further away you are from it, either north or south, generally speaking, the what the whiter people's skins become. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, you told me, I was talking, I was talking to you about this um, the other day because we were discussing it because obviously anyone with any sense thinks that any difference in like race is, I'm not going to get really, really deep into this because it's meant to be like science, but simple, not too political, but like people being racist is so triggering to me. And so upsetting and annoying. And I want to ask you, with melanin, what is it? What, actually, what is it? Because like, so, it, it links to, obviously, people you know, being close to the equator generally have darker complexions and people up further up north, especially people in Iceland and Norway, that sort of thing, they're generally whiter. So I want to ask you about yeah. that because that's to do with... Um, so this is a bit of a segue because it goes into basically gene expression. Okay. Um, melanin is a pigment. Mm-hmm. It's just brown pigment. Okay. Uh, and when your cells uh, are, uh, experience ultraviolet light, mm-hmm. your skin, your cells respond to that by producing melanin, which then darkens the cells mm-hmm. and gives you your tan or whatever. Um, but it also means that less of the harmful UV rays actually manage to get to the nucleus of the cell, which mm-hmm. is the important mix. That's where all the DNA is. Yeah. Uh, for basically to say people in the north in the, high, the, the higher latitudes um, basically the light intensity is lower because mm-hmm. of the whole thing we just said about the tilt of the earth and the spread out of the energy Yeah. Uh, so there's less requirement for melanin in the skin so you end up with lighter skin so it's very simple um, Mel- the melanin is basically a protect it's, it's a the melanin is just it's the color, the pigment is the color brown and it's just a protection of the nucleus. Yeah. So obviously, if you're exposed to the sun all the time, like you know, people for let's use Africa for the example. Obviously, the part obviously certain parts of Africa, because Africa's a continent, are much closer to the equator. They have they generally have darker complexions because they have a, a much more intense amount of UV coming in. Therefore, yeah. they need more protection. And obviously, when people go further up north, we get less UV, uh, so we don't need protection from it necessarily and yeah so you probably have to do some research and look into some papers and things people have probably researched this to some degree yeah um but essentially what then makes white people and black people Mm. is basically the natural expression of melanin in in the skin by normal because the idea is okay so as a response to being in the like higher latitudes your body produces less melanin Mm -hmm. so over time, like epigenetically, your body naturally produces a lower level of melanin all the time. Yeah. And then that means that you get start getting white people. Hmm. Um, there's a good analogy, I think, if people look at something called Daisy World. 
Okay. I think that's a good way. There's a good analogy of it. It comes out about, oh, if there's a planet, it's empty. Then life turns up and there's some black daisies. Mm. The black daisies are all, all the energy and stuff. And then it just spreads out and spreads out. And then you end up with white. It's a good model of it and demonstration. Okay. Um, so, and you say that's called Daisy World. Daisy World. Well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll make a note of that right now. I, can hear the I, quick, I, re- I remember it. Button. I don't know how decent it would be to find. It might be something to look up on YouTube or something. But... Yeah, well, I'll take a look. I'll see what I can find. Um, if, if I can't find it for whatever reason, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it in the uh, the intro outro mm-hmm. that I can't uh, find it. But I'll make a note of that now. So I've just written Daisy World down. Yeah. So I'll try to um, just release this. I'll add that in. But but yeah, that's so that's basically it. And that's also a reason because um, the whole thing, uh, the uh, you your body does require a certain degree of sunlight to produce things like vitamin D. Mm-hmm. Um, because people with darker skin absorb less sunlight through their skin. Mm -hmm. It means that when they are in the high latitudes, they don't produce as much of things like vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's one of the reasons why it's not uncommon for black people and people with just darker complexions in general Mm -hmm. to take things like vitamin D supplements because they, otherwise they just don't get enough, even if they are in the sun all the time, because the light intensity at those latitudes Mm -hmm. just doesn't provide enough for them. Well, it's also, you know, and with a little thing that, especially in today's society as well, I like I have a slight vitamin D deficiency. I think almost all of us do, to be honest, because you work a nine to five as well, which is quite a funny, which is quite a funny thing. But yeah, obviously, what you're saying is is it's 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 funny because it, this shouldn't be even a remotely controversial topic in any way, shape, or form. It, it really no. shouldn't be. It it's just pure science. It's just the way it is. But people have to ruin things by being all racist and shit. And uh, that, that's one of the things where people have come out as like the like through studies yes there are uh patterns in terms of genes and all that sort of thing that go around in terms of obviously people that are of asian descent or middle eastern or african or european and all that they all have distinct differences and uh a definite expression of certain genes yeah but that's all it is like that race isn't a thing yeah, like scientifically, race is not a thing. It's just we are all Homo sapiens. Yeah, and that's how we should. That's, that's it. Exactly how we should be. It's like ever so slight minor variations in each other, which never, you know, they don't contribute to the individual level. But I'm sure at some point in the future, because obviously me and Reese did that uh, yeah, episode about transgender. I'm sure mm-hmm. we'll have another um, we'll sort of organize another a night where we do some sort of other. Uh, in air quotes, controversial topic, just things that really should be very controversial, but are. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, we'll come off that uh, slightly now because I think we've kind of uh, done everything with that. And um, what we want to get onto now, because um, we spoke on the climate and seasons, and then if we get into sort of uh, climate change a little bit and the sort of um, the greenhouse gases and that sort of thing, mm-hmm. I know this. What that sentence was almost all everything I know <laughs> about <laughs> climate change. I don't actually know very much about climate change. Just I just know a lot of other people who are much smarter than me know a lot about it. So from what you, uh, I know I remember you saying about there's the the, the gas uh, bubbles in the ice and the greenhouse gases. They're, they're the two main things I remember. So okay. I'm gonna just throw them at you and then see if you can <laughs> make sense of it. So. One thing I think is a good thing to touch on is there used to be the thing we called global warming. Yeah. And now we've started to approach it as climate change. Yeah. Um, It's been changed in that way because global warming is a part of climate change, Mm. but it's not entirely climate change. Yeah. Uh, And what people mean by global warming is a a rise in the average global temperature, Mm -hmm. uh, which some places due to changes in sea levels and water and all that sort of thing might actually get colder. Yeah. But overall the planet will be heating up. Mm-hmm. Like it's, this is one of the things when people say, Oh, it's snowed for the first time in 20 years or something. It's like, Oh, so much for global warming. It's like, no, that's not the <laughs> point. Um, I can see uh, people can't see, but I just know how much that is triggering you. Um, I will just want to, I want to add a little caveat here, um, which will, <clears throat> excuse me, um, which was, I actually was looking up about, um, uh, about global warming and one of the things that I found really interesting I think me and Wayne uh, touched upon it uh, in the episode that we did and it was for example one of the reasons it's so it can be so detrimental to um, to people on the planet and things people go oh if it gets a little bit warmer what's the big deal there's there's in, there's so many different things of reasons why that can be a bad thing but one of them that I found quite interesting was uh, rep, certain reptiles um, I think mm-hmm. it's turtles alligators and crocodiles I know exactly what you're going to say and yes yeah. turtles are specifically I know about yeah, you're um, the expert going to the Galapagos, so I wanted to bring that up. 
Uh, that's not so much a turtle thing, but just in general turtles. Um, the gender or sex, I say biological sex. Yeah. Yes, talking about gender is more. <laughs> that's, that's another rabbit hole. Turtle genders, oh god. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so the biological sex of turtles uh, is determined by the temperature when they're essentially in incubation mm-hmm. while they're developing and wanting to hatch. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember which way it is, but generally, if if they're above a certain temperature, they'll become either male or female, and if they're below a certain temperature, they'll be the other. Yeah. Uh, which is why places such as turtle hatcheries and things that try and are uh, trying to help those populations mm-hmm. often make sure they like basically put eggs in their mounds underground and stuff, like create the own nests, mm-hmm. um, and then put up like bushes and hedgerows and all that sort of thing in front of half of them hmm. so they're shaded from the sun so that they are they go they are colder and we'll make sure they have a roughly 50 50 split yeah i've just i just go- had a quick uh, google i actually found this article earlier um, which is why i was fumbling over my words earlier because i was trying to get it up cleverly um it says that um research shows turtles egg uh, when turtle eggs incubate below 81.86 degrees fahrenheit oh, fahrenheit uh the turtle hatchlings will be male if the eggs are above 87 fahrenheit the hatchlings will be female uh, in between that amount it's kind of half and half ish it's, mm-hmm. it's a fluctuation it's not an exact thing no, but it's like, like it's yeah lower it's temperature general... is male higher temperature is female basically. yeah so obviously if the global yeah. temperature does go up by several degrees then it would mean there's a much higher disproportionate amount of female turtles which, which will, will make it... lower re- successful reproduction rates exactly which will and cut down you're constantly then uh because the average temperature has gone up in that way what you're doing is having say 70 percent females and then because there's only 30% of males, let's say 30% of those females actually reproduce. Mm. But then 70% of that population now is female. Yeah. So it's like, it's continuously like smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and that, population. Yeah. And that brings and on a whole All, all you need for something to be basically classified as extinct is that they cannot, no, they can no longer reproduce. Okay. So like, because there's something, they, I don't know whether you ever heard of Lonesome George. Is that the, 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 the grey ape? No. Oh, Lonesome, just... Lonesome George is, uh, well, was uh, one of the last Pinta Island tortoise from the Galapagos. Was that one of the gigantic ones? Yes. Okay. And he was the last of his sub, uh, subspecies. Hmm. Um, and he was male. And they did everything they could, trying to search like across the island, everything, t- to find a female. They even tried to mate him with females of another subspecies without success. Hmm. Uh, and eventually he died, and he was basically extinct. Right. Even though that that individual was alive, mm. the species was extinct I because see. there could no longer be any more. It's the end of the line, yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Um, but it's basically that. That's uh, like in the end, that's what will happen to certain things because mm. of temperatures. Um, yeah. And that was a little caveat. I just want to remember mm-hmm. that because otherwise I'd end up cutting you through some sort of big thing. But that was one of the that was one of the little reasons of yeah, about global warming and climate change. But yeah, so if we get into sort of the causes a bit more, uh, so there's a lot of things. Um, there's things like uh, well, there's the obvious ones like burning fossil fuels, mm-hmm. which is all in our our cars and homes, like coal power stations, gas, and everything like that. Um, because that's those are very very big carbon stores that ha- carbon sinks that have been generated over millions of years yeah um and now we're releasing them at a very very rapid rate very very rapid rate Mm. um uh then there's uh there's other things that are in a way net contributors to uh things like co2 concentration in the atmosphere Mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily direct such as deforestation okay because yeah you, you might um Burning the for the the wood may is essentially carbon neutral because it's been recently taken out of the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. But by cutting down a forest and not replanting, you're reducing the amount, the capacity to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere by photosynthesis. I never thought about so that. So it, yeah. it's like a net increase, yeah. but not di- by directly inputting it by removing the ability to take it out. I see, yeah, yeah, you're removing a mechanism of conversion, therefore, obviously... Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sort of sense. I never thought about... Obviously, I know deforestation was bad, but I, I didn't even think about it being con- to do with uh, climate change, but that makes complete sense. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, obviously. Uh, for- forests and things also have a... 
because of uh, absorption of heat and all that sort of thing, I think they ha- also have some degree of a net cooling effect on an area as well. Yeah, okay. Um, whereas things like, say, for example, people talk about the temperature difference being like you always end up with this hot pocket around London yeah. or around uh, Los Angeles or something like that because of the air and pollution and stuff around there mm. or smog as they it's, sometimes it's called. Yeah. Um, and that's basically there's so little vegetation and so much like extra certain certain gases in the air that it traps the heat mm. and then that pocket of area gets much warmer than the surrounding area and the surrounding uh, things like fields and forests and stuff because the heat is being trapped there rather than being allowed to then leave during the night and all that sort of thing. I see. Yeah. Okay. And that's also um, is it if we if we just dabble in the ozone layer for a moment then. It's from what I've heard is like certain areas, uh, the ozone layer is basically thinner. Like the over, I think China's... ozone layer, to my knowledge, is not to do with climate change at all. Okay, that is to do with UV, right? And UV, as in things like sunburn and skin cancers, is dangerous. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even with the ozone layer, that some a decent amount still gets through and can be dangerous. Mm. Uh, but without the ozone layer, we'd basically be unprotected from UV radiation. I see, yeah. I've and just... that then would mean a huge amount of things in terms of cancers and generally things not being able to survive in life in general because uh, the UV would just continuously damage cells and you'd end up with everything just dying because this DNA becomes too damaged to be able to actually function. So it's like a protective layer, essentially. Yes. Yeah, like a filter, almost. It is actually uh, tri- triatomic oxygen. Yeah. I've so, just, O3. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I was just looking at that. It says the ozone layer, also called the stratosphere, uh, is composed of the ozone gas, 90% of the total ozone in the atmosphere. Uh, the ozone has three oxygen atoms and is the result of um, action of ultraviolet radiation on oxygen molecules composed of two oxygen atoms. So yes, you're correct. So okay, well, what? So the confusion, obviously, there, because I don't know what I'm talking about. So it's good that I'm on here. Uh, so with with the whole greenhouse gases thing, it's um, I remember there's that Futurama joke about it, that episode where they just drop a giant ice cube in the ocean to mm. <laughs> to cool the earth, which yeah. is I bet if if especially the Ameri- the uh, United States, I think if they could get away with that, they probably would do that. <laughs> if they thought that that would actually solve anything, then that would. Mm-hmm. Be what I think even people in the United States are clever enough to know that actually would not do anything. I think there's a lot of you people... Need, you need to move heat somewhere to create that much ice. <laughs> and then to then melt it, it's like... Then that just heat just goes back into that. So it, it's like you're having to increase, essentially... Because you're moving heat out of that water to freeze it. Yeah. Uh, so that heat has to go somewhere. Yeah. And then you're then using the ice to cool it again. So it's a net, like, nothing happens. Well, that's why they would mine Halley's Comet. That was their thing, because they, they, Earth was out of ice, because it was too nah. hot. <laughs> how, how do you get on Halley's Comet, though? Well, they, I know this is future armor, but... Yeah, they flew a ship on there, and then mined it, and they had a giant cup holder in it, and they a drill goes down, and then these giant ice cubes go in this absolutely colossal cup. <laughs> and then they pull out in the ocean. <laughs> future armor. So, so stupid. And then the way they solved it was all the robots... Um, pointed their exhaust fumes in one area and pushed the earth away from the sun mm-hmm. and gave them an extra week. Although that's, or <laughs> as we've said, yeah, exactly. that doesn't actually achieve much. <laughs> yeah, it just extends the amount, it just makes our years slightly longer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just want to bring that in because that, that future armor joke uh, humoured me. Um, so with, with just back to uh, sort of greenhouse gases and that sort of thing. So yeah. obviously fossil fuels is one thing. Um, which is, is the main one people know about, obviously trying to do green energy with wind farms, hydro energy, all these sorts of other things, which I'm obviously a proponent of. Um, and then there's the thing that you told me, which is, is it, is it sulfur, no, methane in the, in the Methane, ice. yes. Yeah, yeah. We're so, not American, it's not methane. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Methane. I'm sorry. I'm Although sorry. we still say things like methanol and uh, methanoic acid and all that sort of thing, because otherwise like methanoic acid, no. Just sounds wrong. Yeah, but the thing, methane. The, the funny thing is, a little caveat, not caveat, a little side thing is that the funny thing is the British, the English language, is that we did it first, but a lot of what the Americans have changed, even though it's annoying, make more sense, like like logically, like not necessarily removing use from a lot of things and vitamin. It's like no, it's vitamin. Pants is underwear, 
and aluminum is just no. <laughs> that, that is that is that is that is my stance. <laughs> Mine is I, I appreciate ladybird and ladybug. I mean, it's like you should have the logic that if we call it a ladybird, that you know it isn't actually a bird. But you know, ladybug. Okay, I'm fine with that one. That, I'm, it's I'm just okay. dialect. It doesn't matter that much. Yes, it does, Josh. Words matter, Josh. You should know that. Um, anyway, so with the with the the methane in the uh, in the ice. Uh, so. Uh, there are multiple greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is just the most common because we produce so much of it. Yeah. Um, and methane is another one that has a large effect um, on like a per molecule basis. Um, there's something they call uh, global. I think it's they call it global warming factor okay. or global heating factor. Yeah. Um, and carbon dioxide is set at the baseline as the standard of one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and methane is then something around like 24. Okay. So one mole- say one molecule of methane and one molecule of carbon dioxide in terms of their ability to heat up the atmosphere mm-hmm. by trapping more heat. Mm-hmm. Methane is 24 times better at doing it. I see. Yeah. Okay. The probably the biggest sources of methane are something to do with our agriculture. It's cows, isn't it? It's, it's cows. Uh, yeah, I think I, it's something to do with that. I think it's actually like cow farts. I think that's that is actually a thing. But it's it's <laughs> it's more complicated. in the, in the, in the grand, in the grand scheme though. of things. I don't think it's that big of an effect from from that. I don't think it produces that much. I may be entirely wrong. Don't hold me to that. I think um, yeah. Well, but yeah, one of the big things is uh, we'll talk. I'll probably talk about um, these in a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's something called permafrost. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in say let's say the frozen lakes of Siberia. Mm-hmm. Um, you have dead or dying vegetation that is locked inside, like, the frozen ground. Mm-hmm. Um, as the temperature would slightly rise, if you have, like, a slightly warm summer and that melts, that organic material can then, say, sink to the bottom of that lake because it's released from the frozen ground. Yeah. It will then decompose anaerobically or without oxygen. Mm-hmm. Anaerobic decomposition produces methane instead of carbon dioxide. Okay. And that's trapped under the ice then. Yeah. When the summer comes again, mm-hmm. that ice, the ice melts, mm-hmm. the methane is released into the atmosphere mm-hmm. and will then produce a warming effect, which will melt more permafrost. Yeah. So it's okay. Which ends up being what is called a positive feedback system mm-hmm. or positive feedback loop. Whereas uh, the initial change will instigate another change that increases that initial change further. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's like a cycle. So it, it feeds itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then you, the alternative to that is something like a negative feedback system. Mm-hmm. So for example, uh, generally, obviously, if you get too hot, it starts to make it really, really bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but generally, in warmer conditions, photosynthesis is more efficient and more effective. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's more carbon we release more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere Mm -hmm. uh it warms up a little bit it warms up a little bit makes photosynthesis better Mm -hmm. so plants take in more carbon dioxide Mm -hmm. and that reduces it back down to where it was before so it's like fluctuations so Mm -hmm. a negative feedback uh, system means that the initial change produces another change that reduces the initial change Mm -hmm. whereas a positive feedback system will keep moving increasing that initial change i was looking up i basically want to look up the agriculture thing so i'm terrible there are there are plenty of different systems and so many different uh, different versions of these cycles going it back and forward and back and forward yeah that it's not as simple as oh more things because the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will also boost photosynthesis and yeah. that sort of thing obviously with methane plants can't use methane to photosynthesize yeah so that's something else I did um, just I googled just quickly, which was mildly distracted them for a moment. Um, was basically agriculture. This is according to um, an article and things about uh, climate change and whatnot. Uh, it says that agriculture is responsible for eighteen one eight percent of the total release of the greenhouse gases worldwide, mm-hmm. which is apparently more than the whole of the transportation sector. Um, yeah, I mean I don't want to get into the politics of. And you can say stuff. the transportation sector. Yeah. But then there's also our electricity and power generation and all that sort of thing. Like, set aside our agriculture, mm. the biggest contributor to uh, anthropogenic, which is man-made, mm. uh, climate change, is our use of fossil fuels. 
Yeah, well, obviously, all the lights in the house, like, unless you are specifically choosing an energy provider like Ecotricity or something like that, is it's basically burning fossil fuels, mm-hmm. damaging the earth, essentially, and that's how we get light bulbs and things like that, which is, you know, some people, that's why some people do the argument of um, electric cars. Like, if you have a Tesla, but you're plugging it in at home, yeah, it is better, yeah. a, 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 like, a, slightly, a, but obviously the energy comes from... Yeah, an electric car is only as eco- uh, is envir- as environmentally friendly as the power station that's supplying the electricity for it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, my old boss, we um, he used to plug his car at, at home and at work, and he was with Ecotricity, so they use... Mm-hmm. All, I think majority, it's not, it's not, I don't think it's 100%, but like almost all of their uh, the thing is, is yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's the renewable energy sources. So obviously, in that one sense, his Tesla was uh, doing that, but it, it's just a... It is, it's, it is a big... It's a complex issue in terms of politics, but oh, yeah. the one of the biggest things is that it's not something that, like... It's like the our air here in the UK. It's not our air. It's just the air that's in the UK at the moment. Yeah. Like this whole thing is a global issue mm. and does require uh, international cooperation to actually try and figure out and find solutions for these things. Yeah. And, and it, people that just want to ignore that sort of things, not be involved, just add more hurdles in the way. Yeah. Um, and it's... Like it's it's not a case. People, I think one of the biggest ways to try and sway people's mind on these sorts of things is not like oh, I know, save the planet sort of thing, because that is incredibly arrogant. Mm. The planet will be fine. It survived worse. Yeah. It's about our species. We will eventually bring about a situation on this planet in which our species cannot survive. Yeah. We will instigate a climate change that means that we will drive ourselves to extinction Mm -hmm. it's not about saving the planet the planet will do perfectly fine (laughs) and it will do perfectly fine way long after our species is gone yeah but this is about self-preservation but also trying to say that you can there's one other thing which is also there are with us all going extinct, a lot of animals are also going to go extinct as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the planet as a whole will be fine. And the majority, obviously, there's a lot of creatures that will be fine. And there's a lot of creatures that, that would probably thrive. But it's the balance of the whole ecosystem mm-hmm. that ends up messing up and things. It's it's kind of annoying. I mean, this is one of those other things where it, climate change, it's actually annoying it's even a political issue. Because, obviously, people generally, not everyone on the right, but people generally on the right uh, believe that climate change isn't a thing or is not as affected by man as people say, blah, blah, blah. And people generally on the left say that climate change is. And it's one of those things where it's like, why is this even a political thing? Like, it's so annoying. It's like, it's, it's empirical scientific fact. Well, I say fact. I think it's like 97% or something ridiculous. Like all something scientists like who go into, who've looked into it, like, properly, agree that climate change is happening. It's such an uh, inconceivable one or two. The, the 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 funny thing, or well, I say funny, I mean incredibly infuriating <laughs> um, thing is that the argument is constantly changing because mm. it was before. It's like global warming is not happening; it's a hoax yeah. or something. And it's like okay, well, uh. <laughs> um, and now it's changed to from oh yeah, well, global warming is happening, but it's not us that's uh, is happening because they shift the because we say well. Uh, climate change. Now we've shifted to climate change. Yeah. Um, the climate changes have happened before. We've had multiple ice ages, all that sort of thing. People say, "Well, it's only a natural cycle." It's like, yes, but never before has it happened as quickly as it is doing now. Yeah. And the only difference is that we're here producing a load of greenhouse gases and all that sort of thing. The since the indu- industrial revolution. Um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has gone from, uh, I think, somewhere around 120 parts per million to 400. Yeah. In the space that that change would normally take thousands and thousands of years. And it's happened in a few hundred. Yeah. That is the problem. Not that it's happening, but at the rate that it's happening. Yeah. And the reason why it's so dangerous and why it would be things going extinct and it's, uh, issues for species is because it does not provide them the evolutionary time required to adapt to the changes as they go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, if it's a real, this is probably quite a bad example, I'm going to use it anyway. It's literally like sitting in a room and it goes from zero all the way up to 100 degrees, okay? Well, if if you just snap your fingers, it goes to 100, you'll be in incredible pain and then you'll be, oh God, and you have to, you know, if it slowly goes up, it'll get to about a certain degree and you'll go, it's going to be hot in here. I'm going to do something to cool myself down. Animals, obviously, 
it, I'm just trying to make it so so as layman's terms as possible. It, and that's what it's like for animals. It's like if the temperature does end up skyrocketing, they obviously they don't consciously evolve necessarily, but like over the generations they will slowly adapt. But as you say, if it happens way too quickly, that there's no time. Mm-hmm. So what happens is the detrimental effects hit them before they can have their mechanisms to sort of catch up and negate that. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's so annoying with me because I, you know, I listen to quite a lot of podcasts and stuff and sometimes it gets spoken about as a political issue and it's just like, the only reason it's a political issue is because there's people in the in politics who benefit from um, certain companies not having to take the precautions to be uh, ecologically aware, you know? It's, mm-hmm. very, it, it's one of those things. It's like, you know, even really down to base that line, like, it's really easy to throw rubbish just on the floor when you're out. It's less effort than putting it in a bin. But you put it in the bin because it's better for everyone and littering is wrong. And it's like, that's like a very slight parallel to basically what it's like with companies. It's like, well, we'd have to put these regulations in, we'd have to train our staff, we'd have to change the way we do this, change the way we do that, and change the way we do that. Well, me as a big CEO, I don't give a shit because I'm going to be dead before this makes any difference anyway. And it's that constant mindset that humans have, which is it's the, it's the arrogance that bothers me, not just with climate change, but with loads of other things where it's just like, it's not happening to me right now, so meh, I don't care. And that's just what keeps happening. It's like we'll, it's like that whole idea of we'll sort it out tomorrow. And it's just that... We'll yeah, it's the problem. I mean, it's a falling just by being a species, unfortunately, that it is, in, to a degree, in any species' nature to act in a selfish way, if you're to personify it in that way. Yeah, we we'll survive. Um, like, it? short term, I want to survive. What after, happens afterwards doesn't matter. Mm. The meaning of life is literally just to partial to add your genetic material to the gene pool that carries on after you. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's the driving force of a few. That's that or any species at all. Mm. That that's it. Like so, I from a behavioral your, your <laughs> from a behavioral and evolutionary standpoint, people that are that selfish and willfully ignorant. Um, is fine, but in terms of actually, like, as I said, the self-preservation thing, Hmm. as a species, as a collective, it's harmful. Yeah, and you've got to kind of look at a lot of things like that, like, um, with, this may rub some people the wrong way, and I do apologise if it does, but for example, the best way to spread genes, your genes, isn't, like, the most efficient way I would pass on my genes is not the best way morally, obviously. So, for example, Mm -hmm. trigger warning, if I went around every single night and raped as many women as I could, obviously there would be a huge amount of my genes being passed on, you know, which Mm -hmm. in the evolutionary sense would be beneficial. But obviously in a moral sense, if you're even a remotely decent human being, that is completely unthinkable. So it's got to be, us as humans, we have a responsibility on this planet of we are intelligent enough to realise the difference between what is, in air quotes, sort of the best thing at the moment or for this random goal that we have, you know, it has to be what causes the least amount of pain, what can be the best for all the future generations, not just ours, and all these sorts of other things that need to... To take the, I believe it's, uh, I think the right word is utilitarian. Yeah, yeah, that's the Utilitarian standpoint, like, for the greater good. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I try and, like, generally go by things. Like, Uh, I'll I'll make decisions based on what I think is the greater good. Yeah. Um, To shift on from that i know you said about i mentioned about the uh, ice ages and all that sort of thing yeah and you mentioned before about the ice that i mentioned before we recorded this yeah um so how do we know what our climate was like when the three last ice ages and all that sort of jazz like mm. technically i think we're still coming out of an ice age really yeah um because a certain percentage of our planet is still it's actually covered in ice yeah i heard about that um but the basically there's different ways um obviously we can measure the atmospheric uh, composition now mm. very easily. Yeah, uh, we couldn't do that hundreds of thousands of years ago or millions of years ago when we weren't around. <laughs> um, so what we have is something that is constant um, in terms of going to the Arctic or the Antarctic, and uh, essentially as snow falls, um, obviously it doesn't form. A, like solid mass it has like the gaps and things in the middle yeah as then more and that will trap some air mm-hmm. uh as then more snowfalls fall on that layers get compressed and as people probably know or I'd, some most people may know from any of anyone that's seen snow when you compress snow it behaves more like ice mm-hmm. uh so what happens is that more layers go on top mm-hmm. compress what's underneath 
it becomes ice rather than snow and there's little pockets of air still exist within it. Mm -hmm. So you can take dr drill down and take ice cores out which can have layers and layers and layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of bubbles of trapped gas mm -hmm. that are have been unchanged because they're just trapped in there um, of the atmosphere from the time in which that layer was formed. I see, yeah. So, so then by putting the thing in, basically extracting it and measuring the composition, mm -hmm. we can see how much oxygen there is, how much carbon dioxide there is, how much this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And by that atmospheric composition and what we know, uh, we can then extrapolate things like average global temperature, blah, 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 all the other things. Yeah. But the important thing is that's how we've got the record of the um, uh, atmospheric composition of carbon dioxide. Yeah. And if you look up a graph, Simply look up a graph of atmospheric carbon dioxide for the past 150,000 years. Mm -hmm. You'll see this whole thing where it's up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. You'll see, because there's seasonal changes between mm -hmm. the summer and the winter. So you get this up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. This little zigzag. Yep. Um, and then that zigzag might go up. There's still the zigzag, but the zigzag tends upward. Yeah. And then goes back down. And then goes up. And then goes down. And then goes up. And then we're on the come up, and then suddenly it yeah. just skyrockets. Yeah. Uh, because we're suddenly adding so many greenhouse gases to the atmosphere that that composition is just going up. It's not higher than it's ever been, hmm. but never before in the history that we've measured has it happened so quickly. Yeah. And that's the problem. You can also look at things like uh, tree growth, wing, growth rings, because mm -hmm. you see areas of rapid and low growth. This is much t more in the, in the short term. Mm. Um, but if you have a very ancient tree that's like maybe a couple of thousand years old, mm -hmm. uh, where there's been a particularly warm year or high carbon dioxide, because photosynthesis produces glucose, which they'll use for producing energy for growth and additional biomass. So when there's been a good year for photosynthesis in the summer, you'll get a big chunky ring and then a smaller ring for mm. the winter. And then a bigger ring and a smaller ring. You get these different rings. That's where the rings of the trees come from, from growth rings, and okay. why you why you can count them for years. Uh, so when there's been a good year, it will be bigger, and when there's been a bad year, it will be shorter. Mm -hmm. And you can use that. It's probably less exact than the ice core samples because you actually have air. Yeah. Um, but you can estimate the general idea of this. There was a high amount of CO two here, or a low amount of CO two here. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. That's that's very very interesting. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're coming up to near the hour mark now, so it's it's probably a good time to sort of uh, round up. Uh, is there anything specific that you wanted to add? Anything uh, tidbits of information or anything else that you can think um, of? I'm sure there was something I was thinking of, and I may have forgotten it by now. That's fine. Well, if it pops back up, we can uh, I can t uh, subtly add it back in and make it sound really natural. Mm -hmm. um, but I was yeah, obviously I didn't want to turn everything into a political issue and this is probably the most political science but simple uh, we've had thus far obviously we try and keep it quite uh, objective but it's I think one of the frustrating things uh, about uh, you and I especially is when we hear about people being dicks to each other like in regards to racism or people not bothered about climate change you know when you boil it down you can find reasons for people acting in this way and it's like if education this is one of the reasons we want to do this podcast is education is the best tool for growth because if you tell people all these if people the only people i find when i hear people promoting podcasts talking about how climate change is like oh they don't think it's actually happening because humans you ask them how much have you actually looked up and the answer is none because mm -hmm. if you actually look it up then it shows very clearly you know the same as people who are racist it's like well actually literally look up melanin what it does you know it's it's all these things are just we want to educate people and people can make up their own minds if people you know if you have an opinion where you still believe that the humans aren't affecting uh you know are, are not affecting it and you've looked up all the research and you have a valid opinion on all that you know we can disagree but it's when you have an opinion which isn't backed up by any evidence that's where the issues lie mm -hmm. because then you just start being ignorant and then you can just say anything and just spout off any rubbish it's like you know and, and once we i said it we've said it in previous episodes as well which is you know josh is a very smart guy and i'm certain that almost everything you say is correct but don't necessarily take everything we say as word of gospel if you're interested in this or you think really that's how it is i'm not really sure look it up 
It's, you know, mm-hmm. if we if you look up anything and anything we've said is wrong, let us know. I, I doubt it is because Rob, uh, Rob, because uh, Josh is a very well informed individual. Uh, but... As always, and I've I've said this, but I know I've said mentioned this before yeah. on this podcast that good. It's always good to men- have, maintain whenever you see anything, like even if it's like some random news article on Facebook or whatever, you're just browsing the internet. Yeah, just keep that healthy level of skepticism yeah before you look at things and uh, contemplate evidence and what are the sources where does this information come from who's produced it who's edited it all that sort of thing like any, any conflicts of interest involved that may or may not have been mentioned like mm-hmm. all that sort of thing it's always good to check your sources and validate them and see where they're coming from mm-hmm. yeah because you might find plenty of evidence uh, that a certain thing is or isn't happening, uh, but people then say, "Oh, what? you you then link that for people and say, well, this is A, B, and C. This person's basically a complete sham or something." Yeah. Like you, you yeah, just double check your sources, make sure you know where your information is coming from and how reliable that is. Yeah, and like, there's a reason there's a ninety seven percent consensus in the scientific community about climate anthropogenic climate change. Yeah, there's, like, a, there's a reason for it. Yeah, there's like people like to use examples of like minor incremental outliers as examples of it not being the case. But it's, you know, you look into it. I am adamant that you will share the same views as we do. But as we say, you know, just this is all about teaching. We want to get people into science again in any way we can because school, especially for me, you know, it, it bored me senses and turned me off for science for years. And then it's only as well I've gotten older where I've actually kind of got into it again. It's just, you got you have to kind of put effort in, in a sense. You've got to look into things a little bit if you want to have a, an opinion on almost anything, really. You you just have to be educated in it. And that's all we want to do is just educate. And then when you are in that mindset of wanting to learn, you'll you'll know to educate yourself. You'll, you'll do these sorts of things yourself. And maybe this podcast won't necessarily be mm. essential for everyone. Someone might listen to this one podcast go, it's really interesting. I'm not interested in all the other subjects. I'm just going to go off and find my own way, and that's perfectly fine. That's all. I just want people to be educated. That's that's all this thing. Which about. I'm sure we'll probably talk about this whole evidence and research thing again because, no doubt, I don't think we actually even read it down yet on a plan. But I am almost certain at some point we will have an episode of this about vaccination. Oh yes, <laughs> vaccination. Yeah, because we'll have ooh, to do... that is something that can really trigger me. Oh Real yeah, it triggers, it triggers <laughs> me as well. Yeah, um, mm. very much so. But what we'll do is um, we'll probably just have another debunking episode at some point, and we'll, we'll add that can probably be most of that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm happy with that. The vaccine. Yeah, that's fine. We can yeah. do that. Yeah, we'll add that in. I mean, obviously, you know, we got loads of time, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think that's great. I mean, if you think of anything else to add, then we can add it to that. But I, I think that's that's pretty much it. If there's nothing else that you want to add. No, I think that's okay. Um, oh, now I remember what I was thinking of. Good. Okay. So, last pointer is that people have uh, put a, a call into the idea of oh, well, the the rise in CO two concentration in the atmosphere has stopped going up. Right. Like for it's it like had a pause, and then they're like, oh, why is that happening? And it's like, ha ha, it's climate change and anthropogenic climate change is bullshit. Yeah. It's like, oh. No, this is why, because they started looking at the ocean. Right. And because the atmospheric CO2 had gone up, mm. uh, the level of carbon dioxide that had started to be dissolved in the ocean went up, which is why it wasn't increasing out in the atmosphere, because it was being sunk into the ocean as a carbon sink. Oh, okay. And carbon dioxide, when dissolved in water, becomes carbonic acid. Right. So that's the ocean acidification side of things. Oh, yes. Yeah. Which can then become another positive feedback cycle because ocean acidification is one of the biggest contributors to coral bleaching. Yeah. Which coral bleaching is not... When you, when you see all these corals and things and they're white, uh, that is one kind of coral bleaching, yes. Um, also, when you generally see colours that are extremely brightly coloured, that is the colour of the coral. Mm-hmm. Uh, dull coloured corals are generally the ones that are still full of something that's called zooxanthellae, right? Which are basically the tiny. Everyone, I'm sure, a lot of people are aware of the tiny little algae that live inside the corals. Uh, the algae provide food for the coral. Mm-hmm. Uh, the coral provide the algae somewhere to live that's safe, yeah. relatively. 
and then they need the whole um, that dust, a very clear water near the surface. The algae can photosynthesize all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And ocean acidification, one can break down the coral because it's basically limestone, it's calcium carbonate. Mm-hmm. Um, and the temperature rises combined with the acidity can basically say that the, zoo, the zoos and theli essentially, for all intents and purposes, nope the fuck out. Really? They basically just say nope and they just leave. Wow. And then the coral don't have a source of food. So then the coral dies. Yep. And then you just then it's irrecoverable. Mm. Um, so the reason why you have this like pause in the atmospheric carbon dioxide is because there's so much in the atmosphere that it's like a case of just diffusing of like its area of high concentration to an area of low concentration and it's dissolving into the ocean. Yeah. And the other thing is that because of the rise in average global temperature, uh, the ability of water to hold carbon dioxide increases with temperature right so the warmer it is the more it can dissolve carbon dioxide Mm. but also the less it can dissolve oxygen right so it's just all these cycles of negative things going on that just like loop into each other and affect each other all intermingling but if anyone mentions anything about the whole um there's a pause in the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration Mm. it's because it's now going on in the oceans yeah and it's a reaction to how much carbon dioxide there is now in the atmosphere. I see. That is a scary and upsetting thing. And uh, it's just like clever. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but it's basically all all fish, all sea do- sea dwelling uh, living creatures that aren't plants. Do they breathe oxygen? I know that. I know that like a goldfish. I think Literally so. anything that it, well, that's not exactly true. But the well, let's put it this way: respiration mm-hmm. in typical form. Yep. Uh, requires oxygen. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's pretty much it. Okay. So, like, you... so fish, they'll get it dissolved into their bloodstream through their gills, and as, as it's dissolved in the water, so it will be um, it will be dissolved into their bloodstream. Yeah. Uh, we inhale and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Plants just take it in through their leaves, through um, uh, what's the word for it? Stoma. Right. Or stomata. Mm-hmm. Um, so any anything apart from there are things like uh, chemosynthetic organisms, things that thrive in oxygen uh, deprived environments, Tartary. and they're very specific things. Yeah. The vast majority of stuff uh, will require actual like oxygen itself to be able to do anything. Right. Well, you mentioned plants then. Well, obviously, plants breathe in carbon dioxide, but do they? They don't breathe. breathe. Okay. Start. There you go. See, this is so what I've got you. Plants are a living thing. Yeah. They respire. Yeah. They need oxygen to respire. Right. And respiration is basically glucose plus oxygen to carbon dioxide, water, and a net output of energy. Mm-hmm. Plants also photosynthesize. As the photosynthesis. Photosynthesis uses... is using carbon dioxide and water with a net te- net intake of energy to produce glucose. And oxygen. I see. So they respire, mm-hmm. um, just like every living thing does, as you said. Yeah. But the reason that plants, there's that uh, misconception of, as I just had, of they breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. It's actually they're respiring in oxygen like everything else. But the photosynthesis, what they output of photosynthesis is greater than what they output with the respiring. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's Although, a- um, plants will be able to photosynthesize during the day in light. Uh, they cannot do so at night. So at night, plants are only respiring. Ah, that, that's pretty much like it's that simple. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. I so, yeah. there you go. So they're, like... they're, they're reverses of each other. Yeah. That equation, if you write it down, or wrote it down, writ, oh God, my English, <laughs> um, is far, far more complicated than just like react glucose with oxygen. Yeah. Like there's all sorts of mechanisms and enzymes and everything involved. Yeah. That's just, that's probably something that's not even appropriate for this. This podcast. Oh god, yeah. Um, we want to keep things but, quite easy going. Yeah, let's just not even go there. Yeah, I think at one point we discussed. Uh, I think I've got it written down. That we'll talk about uh, sort of uh, metabolizing and how. Yeah, we won't go there. Well. I'll probably talk but, about the the specific thing that. Yeah. Uh, respiration produces. Yeah. A certain molecule that it does. It stores the energy in it, like chemically, to be transported around the body. So if you just, you know, if you just produce energy, it's like where's that energy going? Like just general increase in temperature and then, oh, okay, well, 
spontaneous <laughs> human combustion. <laughs> uh, just people um, so yeah that, that that's the whole thing like plants will respire they also photosynthesize mm. uh, there are other things that such as deep sea stuff that have things called chemosynthetic bacteria right which do photosynthesis but they do it through metabolizing things like sulfur and all that sort of thing so they, they do it without light without the whole um like it's without light, basically. Yeah. They do it in other ways, which is why you can get all these cave systems full of stuff. Um, sometimes often with extremely acidic conditions from things that are bacterial colonies hanging from the ceiling that are literally dripping unbelievably concentrated sulfuric acid. Oh, wow. Okay. Like, it's like just literally, just you wouldn't want to touch it because it would fucking start dissolving you. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Um, but that's just probably hold it there we kind of filled in I remember the thing I wanted to talk about talked about it yeah we're now on another segue which is probably for another time let's probably leave it there that's a good shout man yeah um, well, but as always thanks as, uh, thanks always for being on this show Josh and um, thanks for everyone for listening and we'll see you another time mm-hmm. and that's the end of another episode of Genuine Chit Chat thanks as always for tuning in guys and listening right up to the end I do appreciate it as I said at the start, there's three other episodes of Science But Simple, so if you want to check those out in the back catalogue. Um, also on YouTube, I've kind of organised um, some of the episodes. I know most people listen on podcasting apps and that sort of thing, which is perfectly fine. But um, on YouTube, um, I've organised it into sort of playlists a little bit. So if anyone's kind of on the app and they're not really sure what to listen to and they kind of want an easy thing to do, just jump on YouTube, check out the playlists on the, the Genuine Chit Chat channel, and it will have... You know, some of them kind of group together a little bit, or you can just contact me. That's I'm more than happy. You know, send me a message on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, email me, whatever. You can ask for relatively anything within reason. Um, just and also with science, but simple. If there's any sort of topics you want us to discuss or anything like that, or you have any qualms with everything we anything we've said, just send us an email. You know, I'm happy to discuss it. You know, either just one on one or talk about it in the podcast. It's completely um, up to yourselves. Um, last week I released an episode um, about my dad. Um, it was a Father's Day special because in the UK it was Father's Day last Sunday, and it was all about sort of my dad passed away of of cancer about five years ago. So I want to talk about it in depth about sort of what my dad was like, what happened to him, uh, you know, when he got ill, what happened to the family a little bit, and then what happened after he passed a little bit. So it was kind of like it's a way to sort of try and help anyone who's maybe going through something similar. Um, so that was out last week. Um, in the coming weeks, um, I've got a few sort of bunched together that I'm going to be recording and I haven't quite figured out which ones I'm going to be re- releasing first. So it will kind of be on Sunday when I figure it out. We'll see then. Um, I do have plans for Wayne to come back, who was, um, a guest we did an episode about paleontology because he's a paleontologist and we also did a discussion about the human condition and um one of wayne's books because wayne is also an author so uh, yeah he should be coming on again at some point soon um hopefully we may end up having a chat with josh on there as well because i know wayne's quite um politically minded in certain ways but obviously as he's a paleontologist he knows a lot about science so i'm gonna be sat in a room with josh and wayne likely talking about politics i don't know that that much about and science that i don't know that much about so (laughs) it's another time for me to feel like a moron um yeah that's generally it for now i think um as i always say if anyone reviews us on itunes or facebook anything like that it's very much appreciated i've seen there's a few on there now which i'm very very thankful for um and if anyone wants to get in touch if you've got your own podcast and you want to do some promo swaps or a shout out or maybe even collaboration anything like that just give me a shout you know we can um talk even if you don't have your own podcast i'm happy to chat with relatively anyone so give it a go anyway guys thanks as always for tuning in and i'll talk to you next week